Hello, friends. I've been asked by a number of my shareholders to give my perspective on the events of the day. And for those of you who don't know who I am, my name is Mike McKibben. I am the chairman and CEO and founder of Leader Technologies. Most of you probably know the uh, projects that I have worked on in the last 10, 20 years. Uh, if you have used any social networking at all, then you're familiar with my invention. Because as it's uh, turning out, uh, the invention of social networking was something that uh, I started inventing in the late 90s. And then uh, in 2008, you probably had never heard of our company, but we sued Facebook in 2008 and took it to trial in 2010. And at that trial, we proved that Facebook is infringing all 11 of our 11 patent, patents that, patent claims that we had asserted against Facebook at trial. That was only the beginning of this saga because as we then proceeded on to appeals and took this case to the Supreme Court, what we started experiencing was something that I never expected to learn about or see in our government. Because what we saw was a tremendous amount of judicial corruption as we watched our judges in, in our case not protect the inventor, but rather protect the infringer in Facebook. And as we went from the district court in Delaware to the federal circuit in Washington, D.C., right across from the White House, and then took our appeal right to the Supreme Court, what we discovered is that all the judges in our case held mountains of Facebook stock. And that was my education in a system of governance that I never expected to see as an entrepreneur. Because as a young entrepreneur, I was told I could trust our patent office, I could trust our courts to protect the inventions of myself and others who are inventors, uh, trying to bring new products, new ideas to the market and so that everyone in the public could benefit from these ideas. But what we discovered is that our system of governance uh, and starting with the judicial system uh, is a very different place than what I expected. So in 2012, after the Supreme Court failed to protect our invention, we decided, well, we could uh, take our uh, lesson and, and go home and tuck our tail between our legs. But that's just not who I am. I'm, I'm a civil engineer by training. Uh, I'm a professional physician by interest. And uh, I am an inventor and a, a technologist. And I wanted to find out why we were being treated this way by our government. And so I was also protecting the interest of hundreds of shareholders who had put their hard earned cash and invested in our company and in the invention that I had presented to them and said uh, that uh, we wanted your help to take this invention to market. But what we then discovered is that our government uh, decided that our invention was something that the government wanted and therefore they intended to steal it from us. Now, some of that stuff about the theft, we didn't discover until the last few years. But if, as we peeled back the onion on this type of corruption, first we noticed it in the judges, then we noticed it in the media because none of the people in the media uh, came to our defense as the inventors. Uh, in fact, just the opposite occurred. Uh, you probably all remember that movie that, uh, that uh, Facebook put out called the, the Social Network. And that was the beginning of a fusion that we saw between this theft of our technology by the government and the mainstream media. And as we began to further investigate the, uh, the, the media's role in this level of corruption, we began to run into a number of things. And as an entrepreneur and as an engineer, uh, I have a high interest in wanting to know why things are the way they are. So 
we really started digging and we didn't really know where this was going to end up. We didn't really know if it would end up anywhere. But uh, like you're, you're putting together a, a, the pieces of a jigsaw puzzle and you have a piece, you don't know where it goes, so you set it over there in the corner. And that's what we did with our evidence. And then we had another piece of evidence and we looked at it and we said, well, we don't know where it fits, so we put it over here. And over the years, from 2012 until this very current moment, we have been doing that with pieces of evidence. And after probably... By 2015, 2016, about the time Donald Trump announced that he was going to run for president, these pieces of this puzzle started coming together and started fitting. And what we discovered is that the treatment that we received as entrepreneurs and as inventors uh, was something that was not unique to us. But we began to see that, they, that a group of people in our government were actually conspiring together to steal technology, to steal patents. And then we discovered through various research, thanks to uh, the discovery of Judicial Watch and uh, William Binney and a number of other whistleblowers, we began to see that this, this pattern of corruption was much bigger than just our judges and just our media. And, and we kept digging and digging and, and, and going backwards in time as we did this. And we began to see patterns develop. And then uh, about uh, uh, three or four months ago, we were able to find a number of NSA disclosures where documents from back in the 40s and the 50s and the 60s were released. And uh, to our great surprise, we discovered that our first director, who was Major General James Freeze, uh, was actually the NSA director who developed the Echelon program that was the first mass surveillance of Americans by the NSA. So when we saw that, we said, well, how deep does this go? Because here, I didn't, it, it's, is it a coincidence that Major General James Freeze was our first director? I'm not sure it was now. At the time, and for the longest time, I have thought that. But then he introduced us to another gentleman by the name of uh, Professor James P. Chandler, who he suggested handle all of our intellectual property and our patent uh, applications, which he did. And as we then worked with uh, Professor Chandler, we were told that he was the best resource that we could possibly have for our technology. Little did we know uh, that uh, some years later we discover that Professor Chandler was a chief intellectual property advisor to uh, various presidents going probably all the way back to George H.W. Bush, but certainly Clinton, uh, George Bush, and uh, uh, Barack Obama. And uh, Professor Chandler was also the, the uh, attorney who filed our first patent applications. But what we now know is that uh, there was a whole undercurrent uh, occurring where the, uh, the technical people in Washington who make decisions on which technologies the government, the US government, and specifically the Department of Defense is going to acquire and weaponize uh, was the group that was ultimately behind the theft of our technology. And then as we then continue digging from there, we discovered that there was this entire group uh, of very organized individuals who had as their mission to look at patents as they were on the drawing board while they were still in their, in their in germination stage and looked at which technologies the government would acquire by either confiscation, by theft or threat, however they got it, uh, it varied. In our case, they just stole it. But uh, they would look at those and they would decide which technologies were going to be weaponized and turned into weapons. Uh, and then that group would then take those forward and give those technologies to certain defense contractors who would then weaponize them and not only use them for weapons, but also use them to make great, great amounts of money on the stock market as their stock would rise with these new technologies. 
In addition to that, we also discovered that they also give older technologies to our enemies so that there's this, this game that occurs out in the marketplace with the use uh, and weaponization of, of uh, various types of technology. In our case, our case was social networking technology. So the question is, how does that relate to everything we see going on now with, uh, with uh, uh, censorship, with the continuing theft of other people's technologies not in, in addition to ours? We are aware of numerous technologies where that's occurred. And how does that all fit together in what we see now going on with the attempt to uh, uh, basically remove Donald Trump from office? And um, I, I don't want to kind of inflate our role in this, but as you know, social networking is a key element in this communication system that is being used right now for various types of coordination of messages and how the media is able to take a message and then push it out all over the planet very quickly and get the same message out on all the teleprompters, on all the mainstream TV stations and radio stations and push it out all over the planet literally overnight. Well, that is one aspect of the way we invented scalable technology that made that possible. So as, it's, as we're discovering who stole our technology, what we're discovering is that the media played a major role in the theft of social networking. And we also see that the intelligence communities used it as a way to uh, foment uh, mass surveillance. So we saw all these pieces of the story, but uh, they really didn't fit together yet for us. And so we just kept digging into this Operation Echelon, which was uh, 1970, in the mid 70s, where NSA formally started spying on all of us. And as we know, Edward Snowden uh, helped reveal some of that stuff. But then we started looking back in prior to that and what went on after World War II. And how did the intelligence communities uh, get to this stage right now where we are today. And we looked, we, we found a very significant event that occurred in 1946. At the end of World War II, we discovered that the intelligence agencies for the US, for Canada, for Great Britain, for Australia and New Zealand all got together and they agreed formally to share all their intelligence with each other. And we now know that group is called Five Eyes. But what we saw there was a uh, total domination of the British uh, intelligence groups, MI6, MI5, GCHQ, actually GCCS was the name of it until 1946. The, the British were really driving that bus. They were really driving that um, Five Eyes Agreement, which was in 46. And so from 1946 to this present day, we've had a a global intelligence operation occurring under the surface that has truly influenced every one of us on the planet uh, in very significant ways. And so, again, bringing it forward, what we brought to that table, what our technology brought to the table was an ability to take those propaganda messages and those surveillance messages and distribute them much more quickly. Uh, they were already doing it through telegraphy, through, um, uh, through TV, through radio, through various mass media capabilities, but the internet really heightened the ability to do that. And so we, we, we said, okay, 1946 was a seminal moment. And then we discovered in 1940, at the beginning of World War, World War II, that uh, President Roosevelt signed this uh, document called Patents at Work. And essentially this document uh, confiscated over 50,000 patents from any inventor who lived in an Axis country and even the occupied countries. And we, we're thinking to ourselves, how did we ever get the, how, how did we ever give ourselves permission to go out and steal 50,000 of some of the best inventions on the planet? A lot of them German, by the way. Uh, and we just confiscated all of them. And what, what did we do? We gave those, there was a special office developed in Washington 
that took those patents and distributed those to selected corporations in the United States. And all they had to do was apply for it and they could get those patents. So for all of us baby boomers, that is the, that is the scenario that we were all born into economically. Our corporations were all the beneficiaries of stolen technology from inventors all over the world that we then exploited in the name of defense, of course. But, and, and isn't that always the way? Uh, so we, we saw this culture in Washington that uh, was very comfortable with stealing things, uh, confiscating things, and it was always done in the name of national security, every time. Uh, and we remember the Patriot Act uh, after 9-11, and that was the excuse for stealing all of our Bill of Rights, uh, was it was for national security. And that has been a pattern that these, these people have used for a long time. And I'm gonna take you back to where we think this really got organized, and that was in 1902. But uh, we see in, at the beginning of World War II, this confiscation of patents. By the way, that was also at the same time when the US government confiscated all of the Marconi patents, which were stolen from Nikola Tesla back in the late 1800s. Uh, so there was a whole uh, development of theft of technologies that were specifically focused on communications. And there's where we need to see that there is a one-to-one -one correlation between communications technologies and the media, radio, TV, back in the day, telegraphy, and now internet. And so we started seeing that the, there were these patterns developing around how our governments, not only American government, but also British government, gave themselves a freedom to steal whatever they wanted in order to control communications among the citizens. Well, then we, then I can't remember exactly how we got the clue that uh, there was a beginning to this strategy, but uh, I'll, I'll bottom line it. We discovered there was a man we've all heard of, it. we've heard of the Rhodes Scholarships. His name was Cecil Rhodes. He lived mostly in South Africa. He uh, was the high commissioner in, uh, I can't remember his title exactly, in Cape Colony, I believe. And he was a very curious man, uh, never married, developed this philosophy of the supremacy of the white race, which they then changed to the English speaking race. And they specifically decided that the English aristocracy had to get America back into the fold uh, and were really critical of King George uh, in uh, the revolution. And he called for a unification of the English speaking peoples around the planet. And it was to be run uh, according to his instructions, like a Jesuit secret society. And they would specifically uh, run the world through a one world government that would be created out of this vision that he created. He had a number of people associated with him probably most notably Viscount uh, Alfred Milner, who started a group called the Round Table, which we now know today as the Council on Foreign Relations, by the way, but I digress. We go back to the uh, late 1800s, early 1900s. This group of people were very confident that they were called by some higher power uh, to rule the world and that it would be English speaking and that America would be a part of their uh, sphere and they were working very closely with our robber barons back in the day and they decided that this group of people was going to be the people that ruled the world. And then in 1902 they formed something called the Pilgrims Society and that group exists to this day and that group is the group that coalesced all these ideas around this idea of a white English speaking race running the world, and they had to bring America back into the fold. And so that was in 1902. In 1909, these same people uh, organized something called the Imperial Press Conference of 1909. 
And I won't get into the details of that, but what was shocking was that at the end of this conference, they, they started a group called the Empire Press Union. And then within a month, uh, Prime Minister Asquith at the time, uh, Winston Churchill during that time was the president of the Board of Trade. He was a cabinet minister. Uh, but at the uh, end of this conference, the Prime Minister set up a new intelligence operation, which we now know as MI5 and MI6 and also uh, what is now GCHQ. And he specifically said in parliamentary records that he was going to recruit his initial agents for these intelligence groups from the delegates of the Imperial Press Conference, from newspaper men from around the planet. And there we see the fusion that we've observed symptomatically over this last 100 years they came together, but the shocking thing is it was newspaper men who created intelligence and used intelligence uh, to, to basically uh, push propaganda. In, in their world, it was push imperialism, and it was to push an imperial, corporate, controlled, one-world government. Now, these people later on pushed the League of Nations, then the United Nations, and what we now see is a continuity of thinking, of vision, of direction from that point, from 1902 and 1909, right to today. And the, the shocking thing is the, the key to their success has been their total control of the newspaper media business, newspaper, radio, television, and now internet, and their total fusion with the intelligence world uh, to basically keep control. So the idea here is if you know, because you're spying on everybody, you know what everybody's thinking. So you can always be one step ahead of the next person. And, and so you, you organize your media, your stories, uh, to uh, basically benefit yourself and your friends. Well, in doing that, the banks are more than willing to go along because they make money whether markets go up or markets go down. But as long as they know what's happening in advance, they can make money. So there was this unholy alliance between media, intelligence, and banking that, that plagues the world to this day. That's what we've discovered. That's what we've learned. Why, did, why, did, why was it us that uh, uh, found these things? I don't know. All I was trying to do as an engineer and entrepreneur was be treated fairly to make sure my shareholders got their, their proper reward for the, the, sh the risk that they took and continue to take, uh, and that uh, we, would, uh, we would benefit from the fruit of our labors. That didn't happen because our government, in league with other governments, stole what we had and are stealing what most every inventor has if they think they can weaponize it. And that's really the, the, the crux of what we've learned is that we um, are the slaves of this system which masters propaganda in order to maintain its hold on all of us and keep us suppressed. And so what we have done recently is we said, how, do, how can we contribute to a solution to this? And so what we uh, discovered is that the government, the, the Congress, passed a law called the Miller Act Notice. The Miller Act, and the, in the Miller Act is a notice, and basically that says, if the government has confiscated your property and is the beneficiary of your property and has not paid you, then you can put a notice to the agency that stole it. And you can say, you owe us the money, just like a, a subcontractor would put a lien on a house to get paid, we're saying to the government, pay us for the benefits that the government has received. And because it was the government who then gave our technology to Silicon Valley, then essentially that the benefit that has been received throughout the world, you can look it up on the stock market right now. It's a lot of money. And I won't get into the numbers, but it's into the T's. Uh, so that's what we've said. We've said, we want to get paid. And so the question is, what agency do you put it to? Because we have a lot of agencies. Well, and the fact is, we now have proof 
For example, let me just give you one example. Thanks to Judicial Watch and their discovery of Hillary's emails, we now have proof that Hillary Clinton, as Secretary of State, contracted with Facebook to build a template for winning elections. In two, starting in 2009, we have hard evidence of that with GSA contracts, thanks to Tom Fitton and, and, the, and the folks at Judicial Watch. So that's called obstruction of justice. That alone should reverse all the, 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 uh, the judgments in, in the Facebook case and should allow us to get paid. In addition to that, what we've since discovered is that our source code, our invention, our ideas, our engineering work was stolen much earlier than that. So we don't even have to rely on the patent, although, pat although the patent's there too. We go much earlier into 2000 time, excuse me, into the 2000 time frame when Professor Chandler uh, took our source code and he actually gave it to the IBM Eclipse Foundation, which then distributed it to the entire uh, Silicon Valley and to the entire tech world. And, and so we've got a, a very solid claim. We've put the notice to President Trump. Now, President Trump didn't have anything to do with the theft of our invention. This happened before his watch. But he is the executive, the president of the executive branch, and therefore is the person that is responsible ultimately for the Miller Act notice. And so we have put that notice to President Trump when we've asked him to pay for the benefit that the government has received and all those that benefited from the government uh, giving it to them. Uh, so while we've said, well, that's a really big number, we're talking into the trillions. And so what we have also proposed, and not only myself, but others in our, in our shareholder group, is we will take the cat, most of the cash that we receive from this payout, and we will put it back into the development of a truly free press, which we can now see from our research has never been, or if it was maybe in the early days of the revol after the revolution, maybe for a while, but for, the, for our lifetimes for sure, our press has been the one who has driven intelligence, has driven lying, has driven propaganda that has oppressed the entire world. And just think what could happen in our world if we did, if we did, we weren't always pressed down by all the lying that we, we hear in the press and, and in school and in our, in, our, in our books. We've now discovered that certainly for our lifetimes, we haven't heard the truth about our history, about our, our technology, about our news. It's all been a lie. I mean, that's what spies do, they lie. Uh, even Pompeo said that recently. And, and so consequently, do we expect the zebra to change its uh, stripes? No. So what we, we have to know that everything we have learned as Americans and as citizens of the world has been a lie that has been intended to support the agenda of the people who are attempting right now to overthrow our president, to overthrow our country, to overthrow our republic, and to establish this one world government that Cecil Rhodes dreamed of back in, in the late 1900s, the late 1800s. And that his disciples then pressed heavily through the British government and the monarchy. And so what we see today uh, in what's going on is there is an interesting deafness of silence uh, about how the British were involved in, in the, the Russia hoax and uh, that needs to come out. And so what we have, we have discovered a lot of things that don't directly uh, relate to technology and the development of social networking, but we can see are, are pushed forward by the same people in our world. And therefore we felt the need to talk about it. I wanted to say directly to my shareholders that we're still out there fighting for you. And there's many of you, many dozens of you who are, are, are fighting the fight with us. And we have people in other organizations like American Intelligence Media, uh, Douglas and Tyler Gabriel. We've got uh, John Barnwell. And we've got literally hundreds of people who are fighting this fight with us. And we invite you to join us and we invite you to uh, put in your voice 
to the president to say, Mr. President, pay this. It's the right thing to do. As a part of the, the Miller Act notice, we have proposed a special license arrangement with the executive branch, i.e. President Trump, that will allow him to re-license our code. So here, here's the issue. Most of you probably don't realize that every app running on your phone, every app running on your computers, and anytime you log into a social site, you're infringing our patent. You're infringing our technology. This is the technology we invented. And um, as a result, technically, you're operating you're benefiting from technology that we created and that you aren't paying for. And I think most reasonable people say that's not fair. Uh, but it's interesting how silent the market is on the fact that everything that they're pushing out there is stolen. But what we've proposed is a way to get everyone legal on the whole planet, literally as fast as President Trump writes the check. And the reason we can do that is because we're saying we will license to the executive branch the right to reuse our social technology for everyone that, uh, that the president puts the license to. Now, the president can turn around and charge service fees and or surcharges on the reuse of our technology to corporations and even individuals uh, if necessary. But I, I haven't found a person yet who's using a cell phone, for example, or a mobile phone and has apps on it when they realize that all those apps are using stolen technology is not saying they, they're all saying they would eat, gladly pay a few dollars, $5, $4, $10 a month uh, for the right to use this technology going forward. But the fact is fundamentally it's unfair and so it's also an abuse of your trust of the providers who gave you those technologies to use, and they didn't tell you they were stolen. And so this will allow the president to get everyone legal in the entire planet as the Miller Act notice is, is paid. Let me give you another uh, very current example because I just heard about it today and saw a notice of it yesterday that uh, Google has announced a big change of their terms and terms of service. And it appears that what is coming on December 10th is going to be a complete wipeout of anybody whose voices uh, the, the masters at Google uh, wish to wipe off of Google. Well, let me, let, me, let me say one thing about there's always this statement that Google's a private company and can do what they want. I can tell you for certain they are not a private company. This is the American Intelligence Organization. This is American Intelligence. This is our money. This is our company that's abusing citizens around the planet. But specifically about this terms of service, they've written very clever lawyerly language. And the devil is always in the details of that language that basically says if, if you can't monetize, if you can't prove you can monetize your your, your uh, channel, uh, you're susceptible to be taken down because now that they've declared themselves a publisher and they can decide to publish or not publish whoever they want. Well, I can guarantee you, I've had specific uh, detailed experience with the lawyers and the lawyer mentality that the people at Google uh, use for this and what we have experienced in spades is that these law firms are practicing something called lawfare. They're using our laws against us. And, and who better than attorneys to use laws which they helped create through our legislatures? For example, U.S. Congress is half our lawyers, and uh, which you'd think should be a conflict of interest. But uh, again, I digress. Uh, they, they write these very clever lawyerly documents that keep them out of jail, but they violate the essence of morality, the essence of our republic, and the essence of a free press. And therefore, they're wrong. Whether these lawyers don't go to jail is really not the issue. What is really the issue is we need to raise the bar on all of our dialogue, and we now have discovered that all of our dialogue, social dialogue, 
in our lifetimes has been run by immoral newspaper men who are the spies of the world. And who signed up for that? I didn't. And I'm gonna do everything I can to make sure that this information gets out to the public, and I hope you will too.